Welcome to U.S. Farm Report, brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this listening area who are glad to have this opportunity to present to you some of the leaders from our nation's capital. Today, our special guest, as we have United States Senator Walter F. Mondale from the state of Minnesota, Assistant Secretary of Agriculture, George Mayron, and Orrin Lee Staley, President of the National Farmers Organization. Now, here is Mr. Staley. The members of the NFO in this area are proud to present as a public service from Washington, D.C., some of the people that are really in the limelight as far as the present issues are concerned, uh, concerning both agricultural farm prices and also the price of food to the consumer. Today, the main topic for discussion in many households is the price of food and the, the cost of uh, the food commodities that the families and the communities uh, throughout the nation eat. There's a probably more misunderstanding as to really whether food uh, prices are uh, comparable to price increases in other segments of the economy throughout the past few years. Also, uh, from the farmer's standpoint, there's more misunderstanding as to just what the farmer is receiving in the way of price for the products uh, that uh, he produces. After all, uh, food just doesn't happen to be in a, in a store. It has to be produced. There's a lot of investment behind it. And there's a lot of work, many, many hours. Uh, people in the cities many times do not understand this. Today we have two gentlemen with us here in Washington, D.C. that are really authorities on the subject because they're right in the middle of decisions that are being made on various policies that uh, determine uh, many of the future policies in this nation. Today we have uh, here with us, and it's a great pleasure to have both of these gentlemen, uh, Senator Mondale, uh, Senator, United States Senator from Minnesota. Uh, Senator Mondale, of course, in the agricultural state of Minnesota, uh, is one that has taken a very active part in agricultural policy and working in behalf of farmers. We have uh, Assistant Secretary of Agriculture, George Marins. Uh, George, identify yourself there. Uh, we'll be talking, uh, of course. Uh, and George, uh, is, as Assistant Secretary of Agriculture, is the Director of the Consumer and Marketing Division. So George uh, is one that uh, makes the studies. Uh, his department makes the studies, the branch of the Department of Agriculture, really on the consumer's cost uh, as far as food is concerned and also uh, what the farmer receives out of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to take any time. We're going to start off with, uh, with questions here today. Uh, I think first uh, we'll say uh, Senator Mondale, uh, as a senator from an agricultural state, uh, uh, what do you feel about the farm income picture and uh, what do you feel about the price of food? Well, Orrin Lee, I think the biggest problem in dealing with farm prices and consumers' prices is to see the elementary fact that there are two different things. Uh, the price that the farmer receives is only a small proportion of the price that the consumer pays uh, in the marketplace. About a third. And uh, I think this confusion uh, has never been more uh, serious than it is right now. Yes, We've right. recently uh, seen a, uh, an order by the Department of Agriculture to uh, uh, buy milk at $4 a hundredweight to put the, raise the floor. Uh, the farmer is not getting rich off of this increase. Uh, the parity return to the dairy farmer, while it's improved, is still less than uh, than it should be. I think uh, today uh, the average dairy farmer in Minnesota gets about 60 cents an hour for his effort and uh, very little return on his investment. Indeed, as you know, we're losing dairy farmers every day because of it. The price increase uh, on a quarter milk to the consumer uh, by anyone's fair figure should not be more than one cent a quart. Yet uh, we see many reports of two and three cents a quart being charged to the consumer and I'm afraid many times the consumer is left with the impression that the farmer is putting all of this in his pocket. There is a sharp difference between farm prices and consumer prices. The same with bread. Uh, there's been a, a slight improvement uh, we're, uh, in uh, the price of wheat to, to the farmer. But at the very most, this should not reflect more than a half a cent, maybe slightly more than in a, in a uh, loaf of bread, a pound loaf of bread. And yet we see uh, reports of two and three cents uh, there, once again, the farmer <laughs> being blamed for the whole increase when only a small proportion uh, is, 
going to him. So I would say the main point that I think is so important, and I think this is where all of us who believe in, in fair prices for the American family farmers, we must pound home the point that the farmer is still below parity, he's still receiving substantially less than his city brethren, and that what he receives for his farm products is only a small proportion of what the consumer pays. George, uh, I know this is right down your uh, line because mm -hmm. uh, this is what you do in the department. I know you have a lot of figures that uh, taken uh, a large staff of people to compile and keep record of. Why don't you comment on uh, however you want to do it because this is another well, field. Why don't I show you some of the figures along the very line that the senator's been talking and if you have questions or comments or the senator has them, why? Fine. Interrupt me. Fine. The senator's covered almost everything I think that needs to be said, but we do have on these charts some summary pictures of what has occurred. And the first thing, there hasn't been any massive inflation in the United States economy, and there's no real danger of serious inflation. There hasn't really been any sudden inflation. It's up about three and a half percent for retail food prices in the last year, which is too much but it's nothing to get hysterical or panic-stricken about. There's been a little increase at the farm level here for a long time, but your really interesting thing is this. For 15 long years, that's the way retail food prices have been going, see? Up, 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 up. For 15 long years, farm prices have been like this, and there is a disparity. I think personally, I probably, probably shouldn't say this as an officer of the administration, but as a person and an economist, I think that certain foods at the farm level have been priced too low. I think animal products particularly, milk, maybe hogs, maybe beef. And really, if the American people want to continue to eat as cheaply as they have been eating, and they've been eating cheaply in real terms, by far the right. cheapest in this world, and as well as they eat, and they eat better than anybody else in this world, there are going to be some modest price increases at the farm level if we want to maintain the kind of a life we've had in this country. It's justified in terms of parity or equality of income among people in this nation and in the national interest of the consumers themselves. My personal feeling is that there should be somewhat higher farm prices. Have you got any questions on that one? Uh, no, I think, uh, I think uh, that on this point, George, uh, when you say maybe uh, uh, getting down the dis uh, to the word disparity, maybe just a little explanation of what Senator disparity really means. Yeah. Uh, there is another chart on that, and it's very easy to show it. Uh, there has been some improvement in farm incomes in the last five years, and I'm very, very happy to be able to say it, but it's still a long way. This is the average disposable income, this black line here, of people who don't work on farms. And that's the average disposable income per capita of the people who do work on farms. Now, they're both rising, but this one is far higher, and it's always been higher. And on a very simple basis, the difference between this and this is the difference in what people earn who work on farms, this little one, and who work off farms, this big one, for the same kind of work and the same kind of capital. This is a fact, and I'd like to see it stop being a fact. It's because of this uh, disparity, as you might call it, in the farmer's return, that some of us joined with Senator McGovern to oppose any action by federal government agencies to reduce sub-parity farm prices because we just don't think it's fair uh, to uh, press down the prices that uh, farmers are receiving today when they're so much below that which everyone else receives for their effort and their investment. I'm proud to say that our, the, the McGovern resolution, which we worked on, which was reported unanimously out of the committee, passed the Senate without a single dissenting vote, and we're glad to have your support for that. And I think it showed that the mood of, of, the, of the Senate whether uh, they represented a, an entirely urban state or a rural state, was that farm prices are too low. Even though we're encouraged by the price improvement, they're still too low, and governmental agencies should not try to discourage the improved return to our farmers. Uh, I'm glad to say that since this resolution has passed, that the, the Defense Department has started purchasing pork again. 
that we're starting to, to buy butter for our school lunch programs, that uh, some of the importation of cheese and pr particularly the, the, the low sugar fat uh, uh, dairy products from Canada has been reduced. Mm -hmm. And uh, the export controls on hides have been relaxed. Uh, all of which uh, I think has shown that the government has thought this issue over again and has decided that, uh, that the, the policy of the federal government ought to be to achieve parity prices for our farmers and that in fact there's a very little relationship between achieving that level and high prices to the consumers because of what yeah. we talked about earlier. Now I would like, if I could say just a minute, I'd like to say for five years the department of which I'm a member has been working as hard as it can day and night along with the farmers of this country just exactly for that end. Now we've got substantial improvement in five years, real good improvement, but we're still a long way from where we want to go. We're shooting for three years to get parity income, and if things go right for the first time in history, we got a chance to do it. But I would say that for the sense of this resolution, Senator, uh, everybody in the Department of Agriculture, and I think especially Mr. Freeman, we're with you, and we're with you with a whole heart. Well, certainly, we've been with you, Senator, on this. As you well know, our, our Senator, leaders uh, calling and letters coming in. It helped because, a great deal. It helped a great because deal. Because we did not want to see a government policy established that would be a long-range policy once it was established. That's right. To use government pressure of any type to keep farm prices below equity. In other words, an equal, equal level of income. I think that, as a farmer, I know what's happening in the rural communities. Uh, the average age of farmers is about 58 year, years That's of right. age. That's now, this tells a story. Uh, the people can no longer take for granted that a quarter milk or a half a gallon of milk is going to be in a supermarket in the New York City, or that there's going to be a sirloin steak there just because uh, they want it. It's going to be there only if it's produced on mm -hmm. the farm. And it's going to be produced <coughs> only on the farm, George, as you were saying there if there is a, su a sufficient income uh, for the farmers to, uh, well, just plain words, to economically be able to stay on the farm. Aren't we seeing this in dairy farm prices? We hope we that, sure uh, we, hope that uh, that we will see some more improvement in this field. But uh, in Minnesota, I think we're losing about seven dairy farmers a day. Right. Uh, we hope that that's moderating some with the improved uh, prices to the dairy farmers, but uh, the return is so low that uh, many, many farmers have just told me that they don't intend to live that kind of life for that kind of return. They love to farm, but, it, but they, they just can't do it as a charitable enterprise. Right. They've got to get a decent return. Well, the, the <laughs> farmers my age uh, stayed on the farm, many of them, because it was a way of life. Mm -hmm. Our kids are going to stay mm -hmm. there if it's only sound from an economic standpoint. That's correct. And uh, they they and analyze the economics. They can know whether uh, the neighbor's kids have gone off to town and uh, get uh, a good wage with no investment, uh, and see the the children that do stay there, what kind of income they have and a standard of living. But I think that the the thing that uh, we have to keep emphasizing to everybody is that farmers do not want anything unjust. They're not asking for something above the rest of the economy. They only want to get up and balance. But I think uh, that. Uh, we don't need to talk about uh, just the farmers here today uh, because uh, there will be many, many people, a good percentage of the uh, audience, that will be consumers. Can I say one more word on those farmers? Though? Right. I, I'd like to make very clear what the policy of the administration and Mr. Freeman and those of us in the department are. Uh, we really believe that in times like this, with large defense commitments, which nobody, no responsible American, thinks we can cut much, and a tight economy, that responsible people should not kick prices up needlessly. There should be no exploitation, no profiteering on this tension of this world. But by the same token, and just every bit as emphatically, where we need and deserve a farm price increase to get the supplies that the people of this nation, not just the farmers, but the people of this nation need, then this department will support it fully. And my hunch is that on animal products, you've mentioned dairy, you bet your life, dairy is shrinking faster than ever before. I think the other animal products must have higher income at the farm level, not just for the benefit of the farmer, Senator, but for the benefit of the American people who want to have meat and animal products to eat. 
And for the farmers, they know that the grain farmer, in order to, to uh, produce the grain, has got to ha also yes. have yes. a level. But the, 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 consuming, the consuming public, and I didn't want us to get misunderstood here, because the consuming public, they don't uh, consume the grain, they consume the end product. Now, I think that the one thing that amazes me as we get into these uh, subjects here that I know that you have the facts on, uh, that uh, amazes me that uh, maybe they could buy an automobile for $800 less a few years ago. Maybe they buy a package of cigarettes uh, three, cent a pack, three cents a pack less a few years ago. And uh, their proportionate increase in price has gone up much more rapid than the price of food. But it seems as though all the emphasis that suddenly gets placed on the price of food when we're only spending about uh, one-fifth of our disposable income. Less than that. Yes, 18.2. 18. 18. Right, 18.2. Well, that's, now that's uh, having the that's figures right the there. He, he was ready. <laughs> no, that's the lowest but, in the world uh, by far. This is right. So, George, uh, why don't you uh, here give us an analysis of uh, what the, the farm prices are, uh, what the price increase has been to farmers, uh, the small amount that has resulted, uh, far inadequate as we all know, uh, and then uh, what the price to the consumer so that they can get a real picture here that, uh, to understand why food is really a bargain. Well, I suppose I start off by saying, as you said, Senator, that only a little over a third of what people spend for foods now, that's a big industry now, it's over $90 billion at retail just for food alone, just a little over a third of it goes to farmers. The rest of it, and I'm not saying it's improper, goes to processing, distribution, and the massive supply industries that support them. But here's one item which is very sensitive with my wife and your wife and everybody else's bread. If you look back in 1950, you paid 14 cents for a pound loaf. Two and a half cents of that was the farm value of wheat. Okay, you look at 1966, at wheat, uh, the wheat component of a loaf of bread is up seven tenths of one cent, and that's all. The price here is 22 cents. So here what you've gotten is a rise of eight cents at retail in a loaf of bread, and you had seven tenths of one cent increase in the price of wheat. Right. I'm not accusing anybody of profiteering or exploiting, but it's a cold fact that the increase in price of the price of bread is not in any measure at all due to the price increase of farmer Godfrey's wheat. Well, isn't it also true that during that interval between 1950 and today, there were years in which the price of wheat actually went down yes, to sir. the farmer <laughs> and the price of bread went up to right. the consumer? Uh, the other day, we, when we were fighting on this hide export problem, uh, they told us that the reason we wanted to uh, have put export controls on hides was to keep shoe prices even. Well, the first thing we knew is that hides went down to the farmer and shoe prices went up to the consumer. Right. So uh, uh, I think that's another indication of, uh, yeah. of, the, of the fact, and this is difficult to understand, that there is so little relationship between what the farmer receives and what the consumer pays. This is entirely correct, mm -hmm. and a lot of the noise that's occurred about this matter has been absolutely baseless. You can say honestly, accurately that the recent increases in retail prices, which have not been astronomical to start with, are not in any real measure due to the increases in farm prices. Look at this one now, if I may. This is just from last year, or this year of 1966 to last year of 65. The price at retail in New York of a loaf of bread went up three cents. The price of, bread, of wheat in that loaf of bread went up a half cent, which is a mighty modest increase at the right. farm level. The increase was six times higher than the increase of the wheat that went into it. And again, this is not any accusation, but this is a cold fact which I think the public of the United States ought to know about. Right. It's true on milk, if I can show you the last one here too. Milk prices have gone up, and as you know, Senator, your state's the biggest milk state in the union. There have been the more... Best. That's a funny thing to say <laughs> to a Californian. Uh, there have been more cows killed out, there have been more farmers leaving at a higher rate, and for 16 consecutive months, the production of milk in this country has gone downhill. This is the first time in history if this continues, then the American people really may find out what food shortage is for the first time in their life. If it continues very much longer, supplies are going to be short enough 
but you will see some real high prices. And this is what I think the people of the United States ought to be thinking of. You can't turn around milk production in six months or a year or two years. But again here, prices did go up. We in the department did raise the support price for milk and we did it to assure an adequate supply of milk for the people of this country as well as a decent income for the producers, which incidentally is required in order to get a decent supply for the people. One cent up at the farm level, two to three cents up at the retail level. So you had about a 250% increase, higher increase at the retail level in New York City and most other cities right. than you did here. And I will tell you here this one cent is not merely justified in terms of equity, but to keep the volume of production that the kids of this country need there wasn't any option. We did what was right, and I'm rather happy and proud we did you, it. You talk about the value of, of milk to our school children. Uh, we sat through this testimony on the special school milk program, on the school lunch program, which includes, and you were, you were in on that. I recall yeah. rather vividly. Yeah. And uh, we appreciate uh, your leadership in this, this field. Uh, I think you were impressed, as I certainly was, by the uh, testimony and reports from dietitians, from uh, persons in charge of uh, programs around the country which feed over uh, 18 million school lunches. 19. Uh, 19 million school lunches. This man's a statistician. Yes, yes. No, I have And uh, the, the, the millions of children who daily uh, receive uh, the school milk. There is no question that the investment this ma nation has made in feeding its children at schools has been one of the most magnificent uh, examples of an enlightened program that we've ever seen. The we health got, of our uh, country has been remarkably improved. We've got about 19 state. million kids in 70,000 schools in every state in the Union, but most people also don't know that we have 7 million needy families at the peak of the winter that we help, about a million and a half people on food stamp. We actually give milk to more than 19 million because the special milk program bumps it up to about 25 million. And then uh, in the years when we've had a little dairy surplus, of which we have zero now, we did help with foreign feeding on dried milk. And it's this, been a good program, I think. And this gets us to a point that, uh, if I may bring this up, Orly, because I feel s uh, so strong about this. Next Tuesday, we go back into session on the Food for Freedom program. Uh, we talk about farmers in terms of what they mean in their local community. We talk about them in terms of what they've done in terms of feeding the American people at a lower percentage of income than any other farm families. We talk about the product of the American farmer and the nutritional level that we've established in our children. But the truth of it is that the American farmer is one of the few people who stands between world hunger and, an, and a world that we can somehow patch together and get back on its feet. There was a time when there were many surplus producing areas in the world, no longer. North America, that's Canada, the United States, right. and Oceania, Australia, New Zealand, all that are left. The other countries that used to be surplus producing are now deficit. In other words, if they don't get food from the outside, they're gonna starve. Right. And uh, this, this food deficit is in the, the it just fa growing fantastically. It's estimated that uh, 10,000 people die daily, that millions are suffering, suffering from malnutrition. And the big issue in this Congress, and I'm surprised it hasn't had more discussion, mm -hmm. the big issue in this Congress is whether or not that we've removed our surpluses. We really believe in helping the world from and preventing world starvation. And the only way we're going to do that is if we have family farmers who are getting a decent return for their efforts. Well, I'd like to tell you what Secretary Freeman thinks and what I think and what the executive branch thinks. Uh, yes, we've got about 20 years ahead of us where if we, primarily North America, to a lesser extent Oceania, don't continue to provide the kind of help we've given before, which I agree has made the American farmer the most potent instrument of foreign policy that this nation has and the greatest contributor to peace and stability in this world of any part of the United States. If we don't do it, there'll be hunger. But secondly, I think we've got to take the most remarkable, the almost impossibly efficient at times, 
character of the American farmer and see if we can get people in these other countries to That's right. use it. So we've got two things. We've got to help with production. We've got to find some way that the efficiency of the American farmer, which has increased about three times faster than any other part of this economy, right. and see if you can get it used in these poor countries. We see two jobs ahead of us, Senator. George, I'm glad to hear you say this, uh, because I agree wholeheartedly with Senator Mondale here, that the family-type farm is the only farm structure that has ever worked yes. anywhere in the world. That is right. Uh, no other farm structure has ever been efficient in the producing of agricultural products. Right. We've never used our agricultural production uh, many times in the past in foreign affairs as we could have used it. That is uh, correct. With the, with the supply that we did have. It seems to me that the consuming public has to realize that here in America, we as farmers uh, have to have an opportunity to get uh, equal profit level because the profit motive is the only thing that brings about an efficient industry and continued production. But it seems to me that they, uh, the American people cannot expect, uh, George, to have continued profits in industry or the working people cannot continue to be, have full employment or a wage scale that they have now and to have the American farmer far below the rest of the economy. You're seeing it in milk now, and the trouble in milk, again, is that if it goes too far, then you just don't repair the damage in six months, one year, two years. This can be costly to the American public if farmers don't get enough of an income to maintain the supplies that American consumers are accustomed to. And I think we have several developments uh, here today. Uh, you, uh, as high governmental officials here, uh, expressing not only the, uh, the sentiment but the understanding of these problems is of vital importance. Farmers are having a better understanding of the problems. They realize more about the problems involved in the entire economy. And together, uh, we can meet many of these problems. Senator, do you have uh, any final words here? Well, I think what we're really dealing with here, Ornley, on the problem of farm prices and consumer prices is a, is a lack of public understanding or an inadequate understanding right. of the realities. Right. These figures, I think, tell the truth. Right. Uh, secondly, uh, I believe that uh, we need to gain more public understanding of that magnificent contribution that our family farmers made to our society, to our economy, and to world peace. Right. And I think that the American people, understanding that, will stand behind our joint objective in getting a full and fair return for the American farmer, and we're all going to be better off here. This is the basis of democracy. That's correct. And it's always worked that way. George, do you have a final word? Yes. There are 7% of the workforce of this country is now on farms. That 7% has produced so well, and largely because it's produced so well, this is the richest nation that the world has ever seen. In addition to that, that 7% has done a superb job in giving a chance for decency and dignity to a great many hungry people elsewhere. And they've contributed immensely to the stability, the safety of this nation, and the people of the United States ought to be grateful to them. Now, George, those are fine final words. We've had uh, the opportunity to visit with you here as a public service brought to the people by NFO members. U.S. Farm Report has been brought to you as a public service in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation. We wish to thank our special guests on today's program, United States Senator Walter F. Mondale of Minnesota, Assistant Secretary of Agriculture George Marin, and NFO President Orrin Lee Staley. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week for more facts on agriculture, the economic gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth.